So welcome. We are doing exercise number five now. For which conditions bypass diets are important? We have several options to select one or several one of them or none of them. So you have the option at homogeneous fork, at high wind speed, at open circuit conditions. Does this have anything to do with bypass diets? No. None of them. At low operation temperatures? No. Venezuela shadowed? Yes, that it's to do something with that. So we cross that one. When a module is shadowed for a system which has more than one module, yes, it also plays a role. So when a module is shadowed, it also blocks the other module and then a bypass diet is really helpful. How are bypass diets connected? One option is bypass diets are connected in a parallel to one or a string of solar cells. Is this correct? Yes, because we want to bypass a cell or a string of cells in case of shadowing of those cells. So that's correct. Next option is bypass diets are connected in series uh, to one or a string of solar cells. Is that correct? No, that's not correct. So we don't cross it. Next question is how are the bypass diets positioned or orientated? Bypass diets are positioned in such a way that they are in blocking conditions for the voltage of the bridged solar cells under unshadowed conditions. Unshadowed condition means we don't want to have the bypass diet in operation. That means conducting. So that is correct. The other option is bypass diets are positioned in such a way that they are in conducting positions for the voltage of the bridged solar cells in unshaded conditions. So we don't want that. So if you have unshaded conditions, all should work without any impact of the bypass diet. Next question is, to second questions, which components are responsible for the weak light effect? So we have here an equivalent circuit. So we have diets and resistances, parallel and serious resistances, and the load resistor. So the option is, is the load resistor responsible for the weak light effect? No, usually we just uh, put the load resistor close to the maximum power point so we can extract the maximum power from the solar cell or solar module RP. That's becoming interesting. So as we know, RP is bypassing really the current generated from the current source. And this has a bigger impact if the generated current is low because then the load resistor will be high. And so in relation, there will be a higher relative part deviated through the parallel resistor than for the actual load. So this is correct. RP is responsible for the weak light effect. Diet would be another option or the series resistors, which is usually caused by uh, the contact. So this is correct here. If there's high solar irradiance, then the current is high. Surely there will be something deviated, but it will be the same amount of current. But then the load resistor will be rather low. And so the major part of the current will pass through the load resistor. Next question is, what are string diets? One option is string diodes are connected in parallel to a PV module. Is this correct? No, as the name suggests, it's in the string of a PV module. String diodes are connected in parallel to a string or PV modules. No, string diodes are connected in series to a string of PV modules. Yes, that's correct. String diets 
block the current into a string of modules if a string in parallel has a higher voltage than the string diode. That's his idea. It's a kind of valve. So if you want to avoid that the current is consumed inside the generator and not in the load. So you avoid that some current from one part of the generator is going to another part of the generator. You want that all generated current is passed to the load. So this is also correct. String diodes conduct the current into a string of modules if a string in parallel has a higher voltage than the string with the string diode. No, we don't want that, so we don't have to cross that. String diodes always cause a voltage loss due to the breakthrough voltage of the diode. Is that true? Where we have the diode, it's in series. So there's always, if in case of silicon, there's always a voltage loss of 0.7 volts. So that's also true. You usually don't use silicon diodes, you use Schottky diodes or germanium diodes, which only have a breakthrough voltage in the vicinity of 0.3 volts. What are the standard test conditions? So a mass given AM0, AM0.5, AM1.0, AM1.5, AM2. What's correct? For the standard test conditions, AM1.5 is correct. The irradiance level, what is used? Is it 100 watt times square meter, 100 watt divided by square meter, or 1000 watt divided by square meter? 1000 watt times square meter or 1000 watt. What is correct? A little part 1000 watt per square meter. Next part, ah, there would be another option uh, 10 kilowatt per square meter. That's not correct. Ambient temperature of 20 degrees, ambient temperature of 25 degrees, or what other options do we have? We have cell temperature of 20 degrees or cell temperature of 25 degrees. Mind, so the cell temperature is relevant. Often in a test, people mix it up and they put the ambient temperature to 25 degrees. For the nominal operating conditions, the ambient temperature is relevant, but it's not 25 degrees, it's 20 degrees then. But here, for the standard test conditions, we have a cell temperature of 25 degrees. Perpendicular incident. Yes, it's perpendicular incidence. Both terminal contacts grounded. That's totally stupid. So you make a short circuit and you cannot extract any power of it. So it doesn't make any sense to have this in the standard test conditions because you want to measure the power usually of a PV module at standard test conditions. And if you don't make it possible to measure power, it doesn't make sense at all. So just perpendicular incidence is correct. What is the so-called fill factor of a solar module? That's a formula for it. So it's the voltage in the maximum power point times the current in the maximum power point divided by the open circuit voltage divided also by the short circuit current. It describes how close uh, the form of the IV curve is close to a rectangle. What does the performance ratio mean it depends on which parameters we have here. This is a formula, so it's the actual power divided by the power under standard test conditions. So usually the standard test conditions are quite optimistic in terms of operation temperature. Also, for the case of Germany, also for the irradiance level, usually we have a much lower irradiance level. And therefore you have losses due to the weak light effect, but also due to temperature and non perpendicular incidence and this is considered in this performance ratio. So it's usually below 1, the vicinity of 0 0.9 for the case of Germany. If you have really high temperature, for example in the tropics, the weak light effect is then less, but the temperature effect is quite high. So sometimes you have then performance ratio in the vicinity of 0 0.85. You can also calculate it via the energy being generated, W actual energy being generated, 
divided by the power under standard test conditions times the full sunshine hours during a year, then you should come to about the same performance ratio. Option is the performance ratio depends on operation temperature. I mentioned already, yes, it's true, so we have to cross that. The performance ratio depends on the angle of incidence. Yes, because we have the standard test conditions with perpendicular incidence, but in reality, the incidence angle is much flatter. That means you have additional reflection losses. The performance ratio depends on the actual spectrum of the sun in relation to the spectral efficiency of the used solar cell. Yes, it's also true. And the performance ratio depends on the short circuit current under standard test conditions. No, that's not true. A photovoltaic module operating at the maximum power point at an irradiance of 1000 watt per square meter and a ohmic load of 4 ohms is now receiving 250 watt per square meter only. To which value the attached ohmic load has to be set in order to still operate the photovoltaic module at the maximum power point. So what happens if we reduce irradiance? Does happen anything to the voltage? No, the impact on the voltage is quite small, but the main impact, which is really proportional, is the number of photons generated and equivalently the current. So that means if we have only a quarter of the irradiance, we have only a quarter of the photons and accordingly a quarter of the electron flow, that means a quarter of the current. That means we have the same voltage, a quarter of the current means for the resistor, volt divided by amps is then four times as high. So 16 ohms is the correct answer. What happens if the operation temperature at, of that module which operates at 32 volts in the maximum power point and the current at the maximum power point at 8 amps. It increases now from the standard test conditions of 25 degrees to actually 50 degrees Celsius. The temperature coefficients are given, so we have a temperature coefficient for the voltage of minus 0.5% per Kelvin and for the current it's zero. So this is close to reality because it's very small. And for the temperature coefficient for the power output is also minus 0.5% per Kelvin. To which value the attached ohmic load has to be set in order to still operate in the maximum power point. That means for the elevated temperature. And there are several options what we see here. So what happens if we increase the temperature? Voltage is going down. What impact does it have on the ohmic load? So if you reduce the voltage, what happens to the value of the resistance? It goes down. If you put in the numbers correctly, you will end up at a um, ohmic load of. Next question is here. From which parameters the open circuit voltage of a solar cell depend? So. The option is the spectrum of irradiance. What happens if we change the irradiance spectrum? There might be more or less usable photons and the current will be accordingly more or less, but not the voltage. The temperature of a solar cell, as we saw at the question before, there is an impact. We have a temperature coefficient in the vicinity of minus 0.4 to minus 0.5 percent per Kelvin. So for sure there is an impact by the temperature. The solar cell technology, yes sure, because in silicon the maximum possible voltage is 0.7 volts. If you would use a germanium or a gallium arsenide a solar cells, the voltage will be different. For germanium, for example, 0.3 volts, and for, um, for a gallium arsenide in the vicinity of 1 volt. Next question is from which parameters the short circuit current of a solar cell depend? 
So we discussed this already, the spectrum of the irradiance. Sure, you have if you have a better adapted irradiance, then you would have more usable photons and therefore a higher current. So this is true. The level of irradiance, sure, if you have a higher level of irradiance, you also get a higher current. Why are solar cells interconnected in series in a solar module? So they are in, connected in series in order to increase the current. What happens if you connect something in series? No, you don't increase the current, you just increase the voltage. So that's not true. To increase the lifetime, also not. To increase the voltage, yes, that's true. To increase the PV conversion efficiency, no, that's not true, no impact on that. To reduce the temperature coefficient, would be nice if we would do so, but there's no impact on that. If just the size of a silicon solar cell is increased from 10 by 10 centimeters to 16 by 16 centimeters, how much is the relative increase in voltage? So what happens if we extend the area of a solar cell? We will collect more photons and we will generate more electrons, but does it have any effect on the voltage? No, so there is zero effect on 0% in increase. As I mentioned already, it's the increase in current and that's directly proportional to the area. So if you put in the numbers and calculate the percentage, you will arrive at 156% or a factor of 2.56. Next question is, why is the current of a solar cell increasing when operation temperature is increasing? The answer is because the electrons are liberated easier due to the thermal excitation and therefore you can also lift electrons in the conduction bands which formerly wouldn't be able because the energy was too low but to this uh, biased thermal excitation this, uh, this is possible. Why does the power of a solar cell decrease when temperature is increased? because the internal electrical field is reduced. So the maximum voltage therefore is also decreased and therefore the power is decreased. There is a small increase in current as we saw at the question before, but it's far less than the loss by the voltage reduction. If solar concentration, for example, via lens is applied or mirrors, what has to be considered for the contact on the top of the solar cell? What we will have, we will have more photons, we have more electrons and a higher electron flow, the current will be increased. So we have also take care on that and also increase the contact area. Otherwise there would be excessive heating and excessive losses or it even could lead to a destruction of the solar cell. Next question is, to keep the losses by serious resistance at the same level, how has the contact area to be modified for a um, concentration ratio of three. So we have three times the concentration, that means three times the irradiance level. First, let's take a look at the relative losses. So we have uh, the losses at the series resistor, P, the upper part, PRS1, and we have this in relation to the total power being consumed and then you have here the quotient so you have the voltage across that resistor times the current flowing through that and if you apply the resistance of that then you have the i in square times the value of the series resistor also divided by the total power if we go to the concentrated case. So we have now three times the current and three times also the power. And uh, if you put in the numbers, you arrive at nine times because it goes into square. We have a nine uh, times uh, the current in square, the original current in square times the resistor divided by the three times the total power due to the concentration. We 
put that together and eliminate all the other variables, we come to the equation that Rs1 is equal to 3 times Rs2. Or if you put the other way around, so the new contact area Rs2 should be a, a third only of the original contact resistance. Another option is, for example, you can only have a certain temperature there and just you don't want only to limit the relative losses, you want to limit the absolute losses because you only can allow for a certain heat dissipation there. So what if the losses should be at the absolute same level? So this is the formula for that uh, for the situation before, as we saw already. So you have Rs1 times I square, what goes through it. And for the case with then this situation, so we have three times the current in square means nine. And if you put this together, then you have this formula so if you put this in, so you have Rs2, which is a new contact, it could be only a ninth of the original resistance of the contact or the series resistance. Which two aspects, a mechanical and a spectral ones, have to be considered when decreasing the thickness of a solar cell? First, very easy, the, because it's thinner, it's more sensitive, it's more fragile, so the solar cell becomes more brittle, the chance of micro cracks is much higher. More electrical effect is that the photons with longer wavelength, they will travel more in the solar cells and some of them will not even be absorbed anymore because the solar cell is so much thinner. And also the maximum efficiency is more shifted towards shorter wavelengths because the space charge zone is closer to the top of the solar cell where you absorb the shorter wavelength. The open circuit voltage of a crystalline silicon modules with an open circuit voltage of 36 volts is measured at an irradiance of 1000 watt per square meter, but you read 32 volts you want to know what has been the operation temperature. The temperature coefficient is minus 0.4% per Kelvin. So this is a, a formula. So you have deviation from voltage relatively. So in relation to the original open circuit voltage, and that is equal to the temperature coefficient times the temperature difference. If you put the temperature difference delta T on one side, you have here delta T, the voltage variation of the open circuit voltage divided by the temperature coefficient for voltages times the original voltage. And if you put in the numbers, you see here that the voltage difference between 32 and 36 is 4 volts, but it's negative because you have a voltage reduction, so it's minus 4 volts and the temperature drive coefficient, so it's 0.4%, or if you want to eliminate the percent, it's divided by 100, so you have 0.004 per Kelvin, and it's also negative because a negative temperature coefficient. And then you end up at a temperature difference of 27.8 Kelvin positive, so the temperature increase. The temperature then, if you add up the temperature difference, 27.8 degrees plus the original temperature of 25 degrees, you end up at a temperature of 52.8 degrees. So we have here IV curve. You have to find out the adequate ohmic resistor that has to be connected in parallel to the solar cell in order to operate in the maximum power point, MPP. So we have all the data here in the IV curve. So you have here the voltage and the current in the maximum power point, and you just uh, put it in here and you have here the resistor is then, if you look it up, uh, the voltage in the maximum power point is 0 0.47 volts. The current in the maximum power point here, if you take a look here, that is 0. 905 amps 
and if you calculate that it's 0 0.52 ohms. Another IV curve, this time for different irradiance levels. So just ask what resistor you have to attach for an irradiance of 1000 watt per square meter and second part is for an irradiance level of 500 watt per square meter. So let's look it up first at 1000 watt per square meter. So that's the upper curve here. That's the maximum power point. So what voltage do we have? So we go here and find here, that's our voltage. And the, what current do we have here? So we go here on the Y axis and we have this current. If you closely look it up and with the ruler and measure it, so you come up here with the voltage has been 0 0.375 volts and the current here 2.73 amps and you come to a resistor to optimal resistor where it keeps a module operating in the maximum power point of the cell operating as maximum power point is 0 0.137 ohms. Let's take a look at the second operation point that is 500 watt per square meter. So that is this curve. So you have here a slight reduction in voltage in the maximum power point and significant reduction exactly only half of the current for this operation point. So this is the voltage here, a little bit reduced, but the current is only half of the current at 1000 watt per square meter. And let's put in the numbers. So you have here uh, the voltage, a little bit less, 0 0.361 volts. And you have only a third of the current. If you do the reading here, it's 1.344 amps. And you come to a resistor to keep the module operating or the cell operating in maximum power point of 0 0.269 ohms. Let's do the same for temperature differences. So here you see the impact of the temperature. You see if you go to higher temperature, the current is slightly increased, but the main effect is the reduction in voltage. So is the reduction also of the voltage in the maximum power point. Let's take a look first at the 25 degrees operation. So you have here uh, this voltage and uh, here that current. So if you put that in and read the numbers properly, you have for the voltage 0 0.3643 volts and the current is 2.77 amperes. Let's do the same for 50 degrees Celsius and uh, you see that the voltage is already drastically or significantly reduced. The current is almost the same, a little bit increased, but this impact is very, very small. So here, you, if you put in the numbers, you will end up at an ohmic load to reach the maximum power point of 0 0.116 ohms. So there the difference is relatively small. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much.